بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا ومولانا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم اللهم أخرجنا من ظلمات الوهم وأكرمنا بنور الفهم وافتح علينا بمعرفة العلم وسهل أخلاقنا بالحلم وجعلنا ممن يستمعون القول فيتبعون أحسنه رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأحد الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته أهلا وسهلا to everyone to the first tafsir درس or lesson or class in the Jumu'ah Mosque 2024 and uh, which is our intention at this point in time is to tafsir the entire Quran inshallah so this I hope will be your intention as well may Allah accept that from you if you make it sincerely for that sake trying your utmost with his support of course nothing 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 can be successful without his support and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward you for that that beautiful intention and all of us inshallah may Allah accept it from you today we start with Surah Al-Fatiha and like every discussion when it comes to Surah Al-Fatiha the discussion about the Basmala always starts and which is the name that the Arabs have given to Bismillah Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim and as is well known the uh, the ulama differ as to whether the Basmala is part of the Quran or not and the scholars have their respective arguments as to why it is and why it isn't and I don't really feel that it is uh, necessary at this point to go into a deep and lengthy discussion on the ikhtilaf, on the basmala for then we would have no time for the tafsir of the fatiha <laughs> so what I will say is that Imam Malik um, was of the view that the the Basmala was not an ayah which is part of an ayah in the surah mashallah so they you know it's part of of the Quran uh, and uh, Imam Shafi'i was of the view that the Basmala was part of the Fatiha but not of any other surah subhanallah um, and so we have this ikhtilaf and so in the Malik Imam the um, thing of importance is to know that the reason why Imam Malik said this was because it was something that Anas bin Malik reported when he said that he stood behind the Prophet in a very in a very authentic hadith he said I stood behind the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi I stood behind Abu Bakr I stood behind Umar I stood behind Uthman I stood behind Ali and none of them started with Bismillah they all started with Alhamdulillah when they recited the Fatiha and a beautiful thing to note is that the year that Anas bin Malik passed away was the year that Imam Malik was born. It's amazing, isn't it? There's no relation between the, the two, uh, worth noting. But it, it also goes to show that that um, that Amal, uh, that, that following the Amal of the people of Medina as a proof is quite profound. That means that there was a practice of that in Medina when, when, uh, when Imam Malik was born, or born into him. So this is a, a very strong argument. Another very strong argument that the, the Basmala is not part of the Quran is that um, it wasn't there when the Arabs, uh, or rather before Islam, there was no such thing. They would say, Bismillahumma, or Bismil, Bismillahumma. That's the way that they would start things. And then afterwards, when the Quran is revealed, when the ayah Bismillahi Majareha was revealed, then they started with Bismillah. And then when um, Bismillahi Rahman Rahim was revealed, and then it developed into Bismillahi Rahman. And so it became Bismillahi Rahman Rahim. So there was a development. And so this is an argument to the fact that it was developed and not revealed. So to say. But Alhamdulillah, it doesn't detract from the fact that it is powerful. The Basmala is powerful. Um, I think it was Imam Joseph, rahimahullah, who said that 
when you say Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, then you are, and then you say something, you know, you do something. For example, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Aqra. Then I am reading. Then everything that you read is read in the name of Allah, is read with the blessing and the barakah of Allah. And that is the, the power of the Basman. And that's why it's, there's no ikhtilaf as to recording it in the Mushaf. That's what the Basman have always done. No, no ikhtilaf on that. So, inshallah, we will start now the discourse, the discussion, the tafsir, the explanation. Yes, that is what tafsir means. It means an explanation. We will explain the Fatiha to the best of, of my ability, relying on the scholars and very little on myself. Because the scholars are the giants, and you rely on them and their and they, um, um, contribution to your scholar, which is substantial. So the Fatiha starts with Alhamdulillah. These are the first words. Only five suwars have started with Alhamdulillah. And every single surah that starts with Alhamdulillah is through Tawbah. But the father of all of these is Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen al Fatiha. The thing to note about the Fatiha is that there are ten names agreed upon for the Fatiha. And the one is Al-Fatiha, which means the opener. And the reason it's called the opener is because it starts with Alhamdulillah. It starts with Alhamdulillah. What does Alhamdulillah mean? It starts with the, with the meaning of this word. If I say to someone, you are very knowledgeable. And so I say, I thank you, or rather I praise you because you are very knowledgeable. And then I tell someone, I praise you for the knowledge you have given me. Is it the same word that we would use for both? In English, not so much. We would say for the one, I praise you for your quality, but I thank you for the gift of the knowledge. And that, that is how we use the English language. In Arabic, it is one word. I would say, Hamadtu, I, I praise you for your, for, your, for your qualities of knowledge. Wa Hamadtuka fil hadiyatin ilm, for the gift of knowledge that you've given me. So it, it is exactly the same. But in English, we, we understand it differently. But it is Hamad. It is said by the Mufassirin, um, I think this is Ibn Ajiba says it, uh, Tabri says it, Ibn Kathir as well. Ibn al-Razi, that that is the meaning of ham. When you put the alif lam on top of it, then it becomes ma'rifah or ahad, ma'rifah. In other words, it is a definite article. So the praise for which definite praise is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now talking about. Number five says he didn't say all of it. <laughs> All of it. That is what it means. It encompasses every single thing that you can imagine. That is what the Al does to Hamd. So just like I thanked, made an example of knowledge, the gift and the giving and the thanks for it, everything, all of that, and compound it against everything you know and everything you've been given and everything you will be given and every teaching and every thinking on rational or irrational, everything. It is all Alhamdulillah. All praise is due and all thanks is due for everything. Lillah. Lavdul Jalal. Allah is Lavdul Jalal, which encompasses the very greatest names of Allah, which encompasses all the Asma al Husna. So Allah is the name that Allah chose to be embodied with all the Asma al Husna. In other words, from Ar Rahman all the way to As Sabur. It is all encompassed in Allah. It is the most authoritative of Allah's names and also the most powerful and all-encompassing. That is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, Alhamdulillah. So again, it reaffirms that the hamd is everything because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when you recount all these sifat, it encompasses almost everything, an aspect of it. Some can be embodied or manifested and some can not. Some are exclusive to Allah, but it encompasses everything. So in these two alone, two words, Alhamdulillah. It is enough to live a lifetime if we can truly understand and grasp it and internalize it. All praise and thanks is due to the one worthy of all praise and thanks. 
who owns all praise and thanks, who has given you the ability to praise and thanks, who has brought you from nothingness into existence. All of, all of it. You can go on and on and on. And there were pages and pages written on that. But the setting that we have here is to, to draw the most that we can so that we can understand it and then start extracting from it ourselves, inshallah. That is the, the point, inshallah. To understand the kalam of Allah. So now we understand the bit about alhamdulillah in Arabic. So when we, and when we stand in our salah and we recite the Fatiha, and we ponder upon alhamdulillah, that al-Islam of definiteness and that hamdu of shukr and praise for not just what I know, but everything those knowing and unknown to me. And the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's name Allah encompasses all his sifat. What am I thanking Allah for? You start to ponder about these questions and you start to think about your day and the things that happen to you and those that you love around you and it starts to filter into your understanding of Alhamdulillah. And so it grows. And that is the point of Al-Fatiha. That is why it has ten names. And one of those names being Ummul Kitab, the mother of the book. Because it looks after you. It really does. Because it is something that, that, is, that is, is nurturing and loving and will grow. Which, which brings us to the next word. Allah, I think this is the only place in the Quran where Allah and Rabb appear next to each other. I don't think there's another place. I stand to be corrected. But I am 90% sure that Allah and Rabb, this is the only place that they, they appear together. With Bismillahi, with Alhamdulillahi, Rabbi. It's Allah and Rabbi. Next to each other, SubhanAllah. Rabb comes from the word Rububiya, or Lordship Rabb. And the word Rabb without the Alif Lam, right? We have Ar Rabb and we have Rabb. So just the word Rabb can refer to anyone. Anyone can be a Rabb. I can be a Rabbul Bayt. The Lord of the house. You know, you refer to um, a mother as Rabbatul Bayt, the lady of the house, right? Um, Rabbul Tajir, you know, the, the, the master of the, or the Lord of the, of the, um, the business or whatever. So this word can be used for anyone, any place. And Ar-Rabb, the Mufassirin say, can only be used for Allah. So never can you ever use Ar-Rabb, Alif Lam, the, that makes it definite with anything else but Allah. And I say to do otherwise would be akin to committing uh, shirk. So that is something worth noting. But here another question becomes this. But here there is no alif lam in this rab over here. It's only rab, right? With no alif lam. So here is now a point to note about the Arabic grammar. When two words are linked together, they are known as mudaf or mudafila. The possessed, the possessed and the possessor. Right? So a rab and alameen are together. And the alif lam, the thing that makes it definite, is on the alameen. And that's where you get the, 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 definiteness, the definite, definiteness of ar rab from. So in this case, we now know that the rab and the alameen are together. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that he is, all praise is due to Allah. Right? We understand Allah. And now Allah is telling us something about Allah as well, that you might not know. And he's saying, above all, he is a Rabb, which means Lord, which means nurturer, which means protector, which has a connotation of lovingness inside of it as well. He is the Rabb of the Alami. He is the Lord of the Alami. Now here, it is usually translated as um, the, the world, I think. It's usually translated as the world, maybe as universe as well sometimes. But... That could have been achieved with alam. We could also have gotten that. Rabbal right? alam. Just with alam, not Rabbal alam. And then it would have been Lord of the world. But here, by the mere fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala went above that and said alameen, means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is now encompassing things that are, that, that, that cannot even escape imagining. For example, if I said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was Rabbul Alam, 
it would be possible for someone to say, but but the the uh, the the world of of human beings. You know, let's say the world of a human being, and it could exclude different worlds like the world of the jinn. About Allah Subhanahu wa Taala putting in this nimati in this what they call jam jam mudakkar sal. You know, this this plural form. On top of a plural form, it is a plural form on top of a plural form. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is encompassing the world of of the worlds on top of worlds. You have to say like it's worlds both on top of worlds. I don't want to use the word parallel parallel worlds or universes, but Allah, you know, if you can imagine it, it encompasses that as well. Um, and uh, essentially, yes, it's giving you this idea of encompassing all of that. But at the same time, also, it's encompassing that which does not exist yet. For example, generations yet to come. You know, so there's, there's a hint of successive generations coming. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us now, all praise is due to the Lord, all praise is due to Allah, all praise and thanks is due to Allah, the Lord of everything. Okay, okay. This is the best one, the Lord of everything and everyone. So this is how the Fatiha starts. It's a very powerful opening, alhamdulillah. And the thing to note about alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen, is that that the thing to note about Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen is that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls this I'm going to be referring back to the names because the names will help inshallah. So we have Al Fatiha already, we have Umm al Quran already, right? The next one is what is known as the 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 next one is known as al kafia al kafia means that it is enough now how can seven essentially one of the other names is sab'ul mathani seven oft recited verses how can seven ayat be enough for you for anyone and the reason for that is that every single ayah, every single word in the Fatiha is linked to the rest of the Qur'an. That's why in the Qur'an it is referred to Saba'ul Mathani wal Qur'an. There's an ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to the Fatiha as Saba'ul Mathani wal Qur'an. Why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do that? Is the Fatiha not part of the Qur'an? Yes, it is part of the Qur'an. But Allah is showing us something very, very, very profound. Showing us that this one surah if understood completely, encompasses everything and links to everything in the rest of the Quran. That's why we can say, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Alhamdulillah is already linking us to what? Alhamdulillah, Allah be anzal ala abdil kitab, walam yajal lahu iwaja, who praise is due to the one who created, Allah be anzal, who revealed the book. Say, Alhamdulillah, Allah be halaf as samawati wal al, who praise is due to the one who created the heavens and the earth. You know, and he made the darkness minan min nur from the light. Yeah? Goes on and on like that. So everywhere it goes, it links and expands on it. So this is this is one of the um, one of the things the Mufassirin um, expand on when it comes to the Fatiha, so that you know Sabaul Mathani Wal Kafia. They also give it another name, which is Al Wafia, which is the fifth name which means that it is perfect. So the Qur'an being perfect means that it encompasses also everything. And if it's something that, it, that you think it doesn't encompass, then if you look hard enough, you will find that SubhanAllah does link somewhere. And so that is the test, or rather the, 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 the challenge that I give all of you. Try to find something that doesn't link to the Fatiha. Okay. And then inshallah bring it to him. Anything, anything you think, yeah, but uh, the, maybe in the fact has no mention of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. His name's not in there, right? But the Prophet's not mentioned, and he's a big part of the deen. Just come with something. Think, think of something that isn't said or mentioned by the Fatiha or cannot be linked to the Fatiha, and then come to me, inshallah. Right? I'll leave that challenge. Um, let's continue to the next ayah. So that's ayah number one. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Next ayah. Is very very profound. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts with Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, which is already blows the mind of everyone who listens to it. You know, He is the Lord of Alameen. 
things I can't even imagine and things I can imagine. And then he speaks about Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. SubhanAllah. The most profound thing about these two words is to know this. It is linked to mercy. But this is also the thing that is most known by everyone. Everyone knows. What is it translated as? The most merciful, the most, most, uh, yes, and what else? The especially merciful, the, anyway, something along those lines, right? It's always translated like that. But unfortunately, the translation doesn't capture what it actually means. Because if it was just most, most, most merciful, why would Allah need to repeat it twice? Because Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim, is technically, if I ask anyone here, he would give me a similar translation, wouldn't he? Something similar? Ar-Rahman means, let's say, the most merciful, and Ar-Rahim means, especially merciful. Right? So it's exactly the same. So now, the thing you must know, inshallah, as I go, as I go through the tafsir, uh, through the different tafsir of the ayat, I will explain certain rules that the mufassirin have used, that linguists have used, that scholars have used to understand the Quran. And inshallah, if you understand some of these rules, you will be able to start understanding the Quran on your own. Allah says so inshallah. It's the power of these rules. And one of them is Al-A'am Qabla Al-Akhas. The thing that is more general will come before the thing that is more specific. Right? So already we know one thing now. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts things that are similar next to each other, He's not doing that so you can see how they are similar. He's doing that so you can show you what is different about them. He's trying to highlight the differences between the two. So now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is putting Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim next to each other. And they are clearly similar because they both have the same root. Rahamim. And where does Rahim come from? It comes from the womb. The womb of a, of a mother. Or a woman. And why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala choose the word for rahma, for mercy, based on the womb? Right? First of all, that's like, subhanAllah, you, make, start, you start thinking, you know, how are those two connected? And some of the Mufassirin have, have, uh, have mentioned certain things. They've said that nothing, nothing captures the essence of mercy, like the picture of a baby being nurtured and cared for inside of the womb. Imagine, you get fed, you don't have to work, you don't have to do climate control, you, know, you, don't, have to, you don't have to lift a finger, you can sleep all day in pure comfort. I mean, you are looked after completely, isn't it? Completely. I was like, oh, that encompasses mercy for me. That is a really good explanation of what it means to be merciful. Right? So that, now we understand, we understand mercy from the Arab's point of view now. Right? Now we need to understand what is now the difference between Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim. Second principle, when words are similar, the one that has more letters is usually more general than the one that has less letters. Which one has more letters? Ar-Rahman. More letters in Ar-Rahman than there is in Ar-Rahman. Therefore, the Mufassirin say that Ar-Rahman encompasses all mercy. That is the most general mercy. But, and here is the thing that's going to cause your mind to spin a little bit. But don't worry, inshallah. It will stop spinning at the end. It's not permanent. This seerah, this form, Ar-Rahman, in the Arabic language, it's on the wazn, on the scale of fa'lan. Like, if I say, I am radban, I am jaw'an, I am na'san. Radban means angry. Jaw'an means hungry. Na'san means sleepy. What do all of these words have in common? They are temporary states. Exactly. If I am angry, I just need to take a cold shower, maybe. I won't be angry anymore. If I'm hungry, eat. Jawan ceases to be. If I'm sleepy, sleep. And then I won't be sleepy anymore. It ends. It's temporary. And so Ar-Rahman is on the same sirah, the same wasn, the same scale. And therefore he's imbued with this quality. Whether you like it or not, it is in the word. It is there. Ar-Rahman. First one. 
Number two is that Ar-Rahman is for everyone, all creatures, everything, everything. Believing or not believing, everything. And some call it Ar-Rahman. Ar-Rahim is permanent. Is his permanent state of mercy. And it doesn't encompass death. It only encompasses certain things. So now the mind starts to wonder. Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put these two words together? It's because in his infinite wisdom, he wanted to show you what complete mercy looks like. Afforded to whom? Who is going to be permanent? Who is his special people that are going to, or his special creatures that are going to get this permanent mercy? Now it makes sense a little bit. What's coming next? In leading into this, right? So there's Ar Rahman, Ar Rahim. You understand it, right? We understand the crux of it. I'm not giving you, but in your mind you're formulating ideas. And now it's confirmed by who? Who? What is confirmed now? Malik Yawmid Din. Or Malik and Malik. We're going to use both in shape. Malik and Malik. Malik is the king. Best translation. King or the sovereign king. Malik, as in the Riwaya Fan. Riwaya Hafan Asim. Right? We have the Riwaya Wars and the Riwaya Hafan Asim. Two different narrations of the way that this one word is pronounced. Malik means the owner. And Malik means the king. Right? Now we're talking about ownership now. What does ownership have to do with mercy? Now we'll get there inshallah. Ownership and sovereignty. How do they differ? Would I say that I am the king of my car? I'm the owner of my car. I'm the king of all that I survey, of the land. But it's different, different type of ownership. But they are encompassing one idea. That is, there is complete control. Malik, that is what it's, what it's trying to convey to you. Malik and Malik, this is the conveyance, this is the meaning that is being conveyed. Now, what is it about? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about a day. Malik is one side. Yawm ad din a day that is filled with Dain, Dean over here comes from the word Dain, which means a debt. It is not just a debt, it is a debt that is due with a specific amount on a specific day or a specific time. This type of debt. Right? It's a debt of giving and taking. On this day, debts are due, they say. So you are giving the, day, the debt, you are giving what is due, and you are receiving also what is due to you. Whether that receiving is going to be something good or bad is up to Allah Rabbul Azzati wal Jalal. But now we know there is a day where the debts are due. The day that is called the day of judgment. Right? The day of recompense. The day of hisab. The day of reckoning. How does that tie in with Rahmah? And about the permanence of Ar-Rahman and the, the, sorry, the impermanence or the transience of Ar-Rahman and the permanence of Ar-Rahim. How does that tie in with Maliki Yawmidin? What is the relation between them? The relation is that on the day of judgment, Rahman ceases to exist and Rahim takes over. And Rahim is reserved for, for the special group of people, all creation. Who are these special? In the next time, we're going to figure out uh, again who these special people are. Now we know. Malik Yomidin, this day, this, these are three. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala establishing a fact. Another thing you must know about the Quran is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses language, subhanAllah, to great effect. Ta'arabat, liberty and influence. In English, when we, your, if you recall, your English teacher will always tell you, when you when you are when you've chosen a tense, stick with it. You know, don't you don't flip flop between tenses. You know, like you know, you gotta you gotta maintain that that flow. In English, we've, we've got this this standard about it. The Quran does not follow this pattern at all. The Quran uses tenses, 
use the present tense, the past tense, the future tense. The, it uses it all in one paragraph, sometimes in one sentence. Yeah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses verbs and nouns to show permanence and impermanence. To show, to show something that is fixed and something that changes. Which one do you think he uses for permanence? He uses nouns. Because a noun is something that is more permanent than a verb. A verb by its very definition is something that moves and changes. And a noun by its very definition is something that remains the same. That's why there's so much emphasis on giving the correct name to something, calling it by its proper name. Everything that we just did now was, was started, every single ayah that we've done so far started with a noun. So Allah is telling us an irrefutable fact in this first part of the fact. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Whenever a word starts with Alif Lam, it's a noun. No verb can ever start like that. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Ar Rahman Rahim. See, the Alif Lam is there. It's just Huruf al Shamsiya now. Ar Rahman. Ar Rahman Rahim. And then Malik Yom Din. Malik is a noun. Or Malik is a noun. Malik, Malik. It is a noun. So Allah is telling us this is a fact. This is irrefutable. This is the truth. Without doubt. And now it changes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now says, Iyaka. Iyaka is a pronoun. Changes from a noun to a pronoun. So you know there's a shift now. So Allah is telling us to say what to say. He says, after you've established that this person, Maliki Yawmiddin, Maliki Yawmiddin, that the king of the day of judgment, the most merciful, the one who has an all-encompassing mercy and whose all praise is due to, you've just established this fact. Right? You've established this fact. Once you've imbibed it, established it, you understand it. Now you must say, by natural conclusion, if you want to be of these people who earn the special mercy of Allah, Rabbul Izzati wal Jalal, all you need to do is this. To you alone, do we na'bud, which comes from the word abud, which means to you alone do we worship. Does it mean worship only? To you alone do we worship. If I were to say or translate it as you alone do we worship, then that would mean <clears throat> that between the five daily salah and between the hajj and the Ramadan and between the paying of the zakah and between the other things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded me to do, I'm free to do whatever I want. Right? That is what worship means. Specific acts of worship. There's no dispute with it. But in Arabic, we've already established with alhamd that a, one Arabic word can have two meanings in English. And therefore the word abd doesn't only mean worshipper, it also means slave. And what is the difference between a worshipper and a slave? A worshipper does acts of worship at specific times. And a slave is a slave all the time. A slave has a master, a rab. And when you say, you are in fact saying, you alone. We know that another pronoun for iyyaka would be anta. But if I said anta, na'budu, it would mean you do we worship. And the alone, the exclusivity would be cut out. And that is the reason why iyyaka is used, if you want to know. So now it becomes you alone. Do we enslave ourselves to and worship? Iyyaka na'budu wa iyyaka nasta'in. And you alone do we seek help from. 
Now the question becomes, why did Allah say, إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينُ And not, إِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينُ وَإِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ Why didn't Allah start with نَسْتَعِينُ? Why did Allah start with نَعْبُدُ? Because if you think about it, wouldn't you need help first and then, and then, and then is worship? Help, help to worship. I mean, that would be an argument. The Mufassirin say, no. He says, in this إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ is the essence of your entire being. Bear with me for a moment. Just give me, your, just give me your undivided attention, just for this moment. And inshallah, may it penetrate. Dr. Bhuti, subhanAllah, he, he said it best. He said, You are ajiz and da'if. You are incapable and weak. Right? That is what a slave is. Hey, you are incapable and weak. And you, mu- and you must accept this. He says, so when you say, Iyaka na'budu, right? You are saying, Ya Allah, I worship, I am your slave, and I am weak, and I don't know how to do anything. I, I really, I don't know. But azamtu. Fa'idha azamta fatawakkal ala Allah. Sah? But if you want to, what you is in your capability is azam. You can, you can formulate a deep desire. You can formulate within yourself right, the want to worship Allah. Do you understand? This is what is in the capability of man. This is where the class comes from. You must, again, I'll say it again, inshallah. You must submit the weakness Admit it. In that is you admitting that you are weak, that you are ajiz, that you are da'if, that you are incapable. Right? And so you, you've established this fact. Right? And the natural question becomes, if I'm weak and I can't do anything, you know, then I'm not going to do anything. Right? Because I can't do anything and Allah can do everything. Right? That, that is the way to go. But no, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already told you the secret. The izamta, determination, that, 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 Stirring within yourself to want to be a good slave to him. That is the point. And with that, so you've established the, the ubudiyah. You've established the, the servitude. Right? That is how you establish it. It is a, it's an azam. It is a, it is a, it is a stirring within your heart, a desire. That is what it is. A desire to worship him. Right? That is within your capability. Completely within anyone's capability. A desire to worship him. Once you've desired it, إِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ أَعِنِّي يَا Allah, help me with this to worship you. Does it, does it make sense? إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ There's a reason to this order. It's very proud. If you can understand this, subhanAllah, you'll change the Fatiha for you. When we come here, you are saying this. You are saying, Ya Allah, an ajiz. I am weak. I am unable to do things. I am incapacitated, Ya Allah. But I desire you. I desire to worship you. I want to worship you as you should be worshipped, Ya Allah. I want it. Nasta'in. Iyyaka nasta'in. Only you can help me. Because you are the one who gives ability. You are the one who gives purpose. You are the one who gives tawfiq. You are the one who gives success. Iyyaka nasta'in. Aini Allah, help me. And then it changes again the fact. And it becomes a dua. Right? So this is a statement of your servitude, of your ubudiyah. Right? So now you're in here. And one of the one of the names that the Fatiha has is called Surah al Ta'lim al Mas'ala. The surah that teaches you how to ask. Now you can look at the Fatiha a bit differently. It is also teaching you how to communicate with your Lord. Right? We started by praising Him. We've established Obodiya, our servitude to Him. And now we are making a dua. <laughs> In Arabic, 
This is known as the command point. But now the problem comes. How can we command Allah? And in Arabic, we say that the command tense is used for three things. One is to command him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you know, Qumu ila salatikum, stand for your salah. It's a command. So they say when the command comes from Allah down, then the command tense is an order. When the command tense is used from the slave up, it is a dua. And when the command tense is used between friends, it is a request. But it is exactly the same to your heart. So if I tell my brother over here, you know, uktub, and he doesn't write, it's okay because I just requested it. But if Allah tells him, uktub, ya akhi, uktub, didn't write. And if he says, ya Allah, uktub li, he says, write for me, um, hasanat. You know, say, Allah, uktub, write for me, hasanat. It is a, a dua. Exactly the same way. Here is the same. Ihdina, guide us. Ihdi, guide us. But now the problem becomes, if we are Muslims, and have said thou shahada, and we make salah. Why would we need to ask for guidance? Are we not guided already? And the Mufassirin have given us a very profound answer. They tell us that this guidance is not that guidance. Inna Allah yahdi may yasha. Right? Allah guides whom He wills. That is the guidance to the deen. This guidance that we are asking Allah for is the, the light. And we are asking Him for the, to, for the Iman to enter into our heart and to establish us firmly on where? Surat al right? So this is this ihdina. Because today we can be on the Surat al Mustaqim, but it is possible that the shaitan of the ins and the jinn, of mankind and jinn, can come along and try to. Azallahu minan, you know, to make us slip from the path, to deviate us from the path. This is possible. Right? So we are saying, Ya Allah, ihdina sirat, do not leave me alone for a second to my own devices. Sirat al mustaqim. What is it? It is a straight path? Yes, that's what sirat means. Sirat means it's a straight path. Sirat also means it's a wide path. Right? They say Sirat is an inviting, beautiful path. You want to be on it. That's Sirat. Allah is saying, that is what Sirat is. Guide me to that beautiful path. Al Mustaqim, an upright path. Now, on this path, you are upright. You are walking upright in a beautiful way, conducting yourself. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that this is the deen. So we're asking you, we're pleading to him, guide us to the deen. Make it easy for us on this, on this path. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, what is it? Sirat al It is again a path, Allah says. It's the sirat. But now He tells us exactly how to find it. Allah never left us alone for a minute. And if you had a question about the Prophet wasallam not being in it, here is your answer. An amta refers to the Prophet. How do I know this? Because Allah is saying, Sirat al an'amta alayhim. The path of those you have favored. Is it living or path? It's path. So it refers to all the anbiya, all of those people who have come before. They have graduated, so to say. And, though, and that is the path that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us to follow. And here is the reference to the Anbiya and the Rasul over here. A very clear one. And to the pious predecessors who came before that walked the path of them and graduated as well. So this is Sirat al ladina and Amta alayhim. Another quality of this Nu'um over here, this Ni'mah, is that it is soft. It has a quality of softness to it. And that is where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam 
is written to as well, indirectly. Because we know the famous Quran, لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مِنَ أَنفُسِكُمْ A great messenger has come to you from amongst yourselves. Mufassiri and say, yes, it can mean the Quraysh and whatever, but the more, a, better, a better translation or better interpretation is from amongst you, O believers, from the group of believers, from amongst yourselves. Azizun alayhi ma'anitum. It grieves him that something should make him suffer or that you should be in a state of suffering at any moment in your life. Harisun alaykum. He is deeply excited for you and he wants good for you. And here's the beautiful part that brings him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives him two of his own qualities. Bil mu'mineen. The ones who have the rahim. Bil mu'mineen. Ra'ufun. Which word? Which word? Rahim. See how it ties. You see how the fatiha ripples through the Quran? This is one example of it. Again, done. Goes back again. That mercy. Follow that. For the believers is Ra'uf. You know what Ra'uf means? It means you feel what you feel. Who knows what you're going through? Sometimes you can't explain what you're going through. You tell someone and they're like, oh, that's nothing. I lost my father. I lost two fathers. You know, this is how it goes on. For these Ra'uf, he understands exactly what you're going through. He empathizes with you. He feels what you feel, subhanAllah. And that is why he's the most loved, beloved to you, more than your mother and your father. You do not follow the path of those who have earned anger. Or rather, anger has been thrown or thrust upon them from all directions. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is nowhere near you. But it does include Allah as well. Because by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not making it specific to where the anger is coming from, it means that the anger is coming from everywhere. And when we think of people who everyone is angry with, there's only one people that pops into my mind at the moment. But I'm sure there could be others. And some of the Mufassirin have gone as far as to say it refers to the Jews. SubhanAllah. They've said because they have earned the anger of Allah, because they know the truth, but yet they still go astray. They still, they, it's like, it's, SubhanAllah, someone gave an example and said, you tell them, the direction of how they can get to where they want to go. Tell them go straight and turn left. They go straight and turn right. And you scream to them, I said left. And they said yes, and they continue going. Like, it makes you angry, doesn't it? And you go after them and tell them, no, I said go that way. And they said yes, yes, and they continue going. <laughs> it's a ridiculous analogy, I know, but it proves the point of, of, of why you'll be angry. And remember the concept that I told you about, a'am qabla al akhas the more general before the more specific. Dalin are those who have gone astray. Does, does a strain as well, what is the better English word? Lost? Uh, more commonly accepted with lost. Those people who are maghdubi alayhim, are they also lost? They've earned anger and are they lost as well? Yes, they're also lost. I mean, because they're not on the, on the right one. You see, so but the Dalin is specifically to those people who are lost. They haven't earned Allah's anger or anything like that, like, or the anger of everyone, but they are just lost. But those are the people you can pity. For example, you know, the, the person who didn't ha find anyone to ask directions from, you know, and he's just walking around, looking for the place, he doesn't know where to be. He is lost, and you can pity him. You know? And that is the Dali. And I mean, Mufassim have gone as far as to say that they are the Christians. You know, you, I mean, you can see that at times they want to do good, you know, but they just don't know how to do it. You know, they, they do all sorts of funny things. SubhanAllah, you know, uh, from a point of where they are trying to do good. But no why it just ends very badly. This LGBTQ thing, this the expansion of this, you know, it's because they think it is good. They're trying to do good, they're supporting it, even though they know it's wrong. <laughs> but they continue to support things, you know, knowing full well that this that this is it, you know. Or it's probably not even knowing full well because they lost, remember? They're lost and they don't know they have to. Subhanallah. And here they're lost and they, they know there's the maghdubi alayhim, they're lost and they know that there's a way to find it, you know, but they don't. You know, they have Google Maps right there, but no, I'm not using Google Maps. 
So if they, okay, well, if they look at Google Maps, they know that's the way, they go the opposite way. That's even better. Anyway, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us this. Not so that you can make fun of the Jews and the Christians. So that you don't become like them. Allah is saying, don't follow the path of these and don't follow the path of those. Because it is possible. But that is the reason why every day, five times a day, more than five times, 17 times a day. At least. Do not lead me to my own devices for even a moment. The last three names of Allah to have before I end, Surah Al-Hamd wa Shukr, which is called the chapter of praise and thanks. And you know why? Alhamdulillah. We've discussed Alhamdul and we've explained it. Also known as Surah Al-Salah li takririha The Surah, the chapter of the uh, chapter of what is repeated in the Salah. Yeah? The hadith is La Salah li man yaqra'u bi umm al-kitab No Salah for the one who does not recite the mother of the book. Meaning Al-Fatiha. Yeah? So in, we know in the Maliki Madhab and in the Shafi'i Madhab it is wajib. You must recite the Fatiha. This is, this is why. And the last one, Asas al-Qur'an, which is the foundation upon which the Qur'an is built. We did the, the Qur'an again, Sab'atul Matani wal Qur'an, the foundation. And at the same time, like all foundations, every single thing built on it is linked to it. So inshallah, try to find, as we go and continue inshallah with the tafsir, try, try to find the links to the Qur'an and try to find something that does not link Al-Fatiha. That is the homework. Call it the homework, inshallah. Try to find anything that doesn't link to Al-Fatiha. Inshallah. In, in anything, I think. Go for it, inshallah. Yeah? Let's, let's, let's open it up, inshallah. I'm also curious to see. Yeah? And then we start to apply our minds, and then we start to look, and then subhanAllah, Allah will unfold for us knowledge that we didn't even know. That is the beauty, the magnificence, and the ni'mah of the Qur'an. Keeps unfolding. Inshallah. May Allah grant it to be a book that guides us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant it to be a book that we live by. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us deep understanding. Ya Rabbi, deep understanding. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us to take this message to those who are not here. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant it to be of those in the day of judgment who enter Jannah bi ghayr hisab for the efforts and bi rahmatillah. By the mercy of Allah, Rabbil Azzati wal Jalal. I need an amen for that. Al Fatiha. Bismillah. Alhamdulillah. Rahman. Malik. Mumin. Iya Janabur. Iya Janistan. Ihdin al Sirah al Mustaqim. Sirah al Ladina and Amta Ali. Ghair al Mawdubi Ali. Mother of God. Subhanahu wa ta'ala.